This presentation won't be nearly as technical as some of the others you've seen today. By no means are we going to get into attacks and exploits. This is more about the types of information that you should be monitoring, uh, where those drivers and requirements are coming from, and then looking at ways to retrieve that data out of uh, all the various different database platforms. So just to set, set your expectations at that level, um, my background very much is information security compliance. Been doing that for about 10 years. I was one of those horrible, horrid, dreaded IT auditors. Um, prior to Sarbanes-Oxley, though, so at that point I had no teeth. All I could do is say, please, please, please turn this on or turn that off or what have you. So I uh, got out of that business long, long before, moved to Houston and well, we all know what happened in Houston, and now we have Sarbanes-Oxley to make our lives pleasant. So this afternoon, we are going to be focusing specifically on database monitoring and database auditing. How many of you guys in the audience have database auditing at a detailed level turned on? Not a whole terrible lot. How many of you have been told you need to have it turned on? to a much greater degree, yeah. And usually the response is, if your operations is no way in hell, if you're the security person asking the operations, that's usually the answer they give you back, is uh, you don't understand what this would do to the performance of the database. So we're going to look at, actually today, external methods for creating a database audit trail. So if you want to go ahead and give us our little here. Agenda, so looking at the requirements in the regulations, exactly what it is you're supposed to be auditing and monitoring. Um, then looking at uh, data access. So specifically, we're not really focusing so much on logins and all that kind of stuff. We're looking at data access and data retrieval. Uh, heavy bent in the financial space. Yeah. Yes. Logging for DBA access, they want to see everything. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the question is, uh, solutions out there for logging and monitoring all DBA access, they do exist. Um, while I do come from a vendor, and you can guess what space we offer products in, we are not going to talk product today. That's not the point of this. The point is to give some education. If you want specific information after the fact about which products are capable of what, I'll, I'll be happy to, to take that afterwards. We will see a little bit as we go through and craft some reports. Um, native versus network-based data access auditing, and then finally some demonstrations where we'll kind of get interactive about building reports and queries and alert rules around data access. All right, so now let's go ahead and look at the auditing requirements and the regulations. So, you know, whether you want to be doing this or not is somewhat irrelevant. You're, for the most part, being mandated. Um, some recent surveys have shown that 70% uh, of organizations face at least two security, IT, privacy regulations. 50% face three or more. Um, so even if it makes no sense, even if you have other risk mitigating techniques, uh, other methods for monitoring access and, and your databases, they're still kind of making you do it. As the gentleman over here said, our, our SOX auditors say, thou, thou shalt. So we'll look at a little more detail as to what they're telling you, thou shalt do. So cleaning that all up and organizing it, we're looking down here at the monitoring and measurement area. And really that applies across just about any IT regulation you can imagine. So much better, better to do the activity and then worry about mapping it to the regulation than it is to try and do silos of solutions regulation by regulation. So now let's go ahead and look specifically at what's being asked. And as you know, all these slides are available because I know these charts are pretty, pretty popular here. 
just going through and seeing exactly what uh, information is being required by each of the regulations. Data access, data changes, system access, privileged user activity, everything that privileged user is doing, uh, system object changes, and that last one should actually say, uh, one of those should say data changes. So particularly today, if you'll go ahead and uh, hit that button there, Dale, we're going to be looking at data access and data changes. All right, next on the list. So uh, in addition to all of those regulations, you have your data breach notification laws. That's how come we all know about all of these database hacks that have been going on. They've been happening for a while, but nobody had to tell us about it until, until California started that tidal wave of reporting. Um, but the interesting thing to note from a security professional's perspective, uh, protecting your systems, is that actually the social security loss of the social security number alone does not constitute a breach. There has to be identifiable information. You have to, it has to come with the name, the address, et cetera. Now, I don't particularly care for that personally because I'm pretty sure if you have my social security number, it's not too hard to go out on the web and find out whose name and address matches that social security number. But technicalities of the law there. Uh, so we can see um, these types of laws specify notification requirements, but they do not specify any breach prevention techniques. So there's nothing about any of the privacy laws, the disclosure laws that tell you how to prevent that database breach. They just say, if it happens, you need to tell everybody. So that brings up an interesting question, if you would. Are you better off not knowing? What do you guys think? What's the debate here? <laughs> <laughs> Just as a, yeah, as an IT person. <laughs> yeah, you're right. The point was that uh, if you're dealing with this, you're probably dealing with some other regulation that, that requires you to have protected it or uh, to uh, do activities to detect a breach. Um, so if you would, go ahead. Um, and I know these, as big as these screens are, you would think they would be more readable. Um, you know, if I don't know about it, then I'm not in violation by not telling people. That's handy. Uh, that's really handy until one of your customers starts experiencing identity theft. And then it comes out in the media and you weren't the first to know about it. And if you think you were in hot water for finding the breach, just imagine how much hot water you're in if somebody else particularly a customer outside the company or press finds the breach or hears about it for you. Um, yeah, and willful ignorance doesn't really fly with the regulators. If they see that, that you are really actively trying not to know about these breaches, they, they're not happy about it. Um, and, you know, tens of thousands of customer calls you're not expecting. So you haven't in any way prepared the call center or the business to deal with this ahead of time. So obviously being here, we're here to learn about these breach techniques, how to detect them and how to prevent them. So, but it is a question that gets asked. Um, and it's not an entirely unreasonable question because it does get to the heart of you know, risk and cost. If it costs me $20 million, to mitigate a $5 million breach, I'm better off not preventing the breach, actually. Um, the problem is that $5 million, it tends to be a pretty unknown and estimated quantity and can grow to $20 million in a hurry. So, all right. So where exactly is this personal or private information? How many of you guys think you have a handle on every database in your environment? There's a, there's a few brave souls. Yeah. Uh, access? You know where all your access databases are loaded on laptops? Excel spreadsheets, in a way, are a database? Yeah. So where is all that information? Um, and it's, you know, you can do some good network scans and, and find out and enumerate. 
course, you know, laptops get, they're not always attached to the network, so how do you find out what's there? Um, you know, there's, there's personal information in emails, they're in Word documents, uh, paper, you know, but thankfully for most of us, that's not what we have to worry about. And the database is the single largest concentration of data. It's the thing that's going to be very attractive to someone who is trying to do this on purpose. It's also the thing where somebody who do, is doing their job and is doing what they're supposed to be doing does something stupid and loses a whole lot of data. That's going to happen with the database. It's not going to happen too often with a um, Word doc. All right, so scan your network. Um, what kind of data is in those databases you didn't know about? So not only is it very difficult to find those databases like Access and Excel, MySQL, all those freebies. Heck, sometimes it's even find, hard to find all the Oracle in your environment, depending on how distributed you are. But what's in that data, because that database? Generally, you need some sort of access privilege. And that could be a lot of phone calls to make, et cetera. If you happen to find something you know, pretty large and pretty interesting, there are data modeling tools that will reverse engineer and it will show you what kind of data is in the database. But you're, you have to have uh, credentials for that. So you know, I don't know how much authority you guys have in your security departments, but um, a lot of times it's not as much as, as you need to get some of those types of things done. But to let you know, there are products out there that can help you reverse engineer a database and know what data is where and how it's related. Yes? The people with credentials are the ones you need to watch. Very often, yes. Yes. So there's, you know, particularly at the database, I, I have this diagram I'm, I'm still trying to perfect, but at the very outer layer you have the perimeter. And most companies have perimeter defenses. Um, we can debate how good those defenses are, but they're at least somewhat there. The closer you get to the data, the less defenses are in place. So clearly you're more and more exposed to uh, some sort of privileged user um, the closer you get to the valuable objects. At that point, you know, there is a certain point everybody tries to, to um, you know, try and get rid of all the risk. There is such a concept as a trusted user. I mean, you have access control, but there are users that are going to have full access, and that's when you have to rely on those silly things like background checks and that sort of stuff, you know? I mean, you, you can't, I mean, I guess you could put a webcam over their head and, you know, that kind of thing to track everything they do. But at some point, you're going to have to designate a few people, at least, as trusted users and be reasonable about this. Um, all right? So as I said, you know, looking at some models, um, you know, looking at your databases and your database tables, um, keep in mind, uh, in a lot of cases of monitoring, um, I know there's a tendency to focus on a very narrow piece because all monitoring activity to however many instances of databases you have in your environment can generate a tremendous amount of audit logs. It can just be unwieldy to deal with. So you want to narrow and focus exactly what it is you're monitoring. Just be careful that data is not always in the most obvious places or, or single tables. There's all kinds of places where data is joined together and you need to monitor that as well. So here, remember our, our definition of PII or a, a data breach violation. It would not just be the customer table or just the credit card table. It's when that data is pulled from both places or the join table. Besides that breach stuff, there's some other valuable information in your organization you don't want to uh, ignore. Uh, so for example, here's an employee table, and somewhere in here, sick leave, salary, hire date. Okay, that's not covered by the regulations, but I'm pretty sure most organizations would not be happy if suddenly the entire salary file were emailed around the company. Some companies more sensitive than others about that, but most would not be happy at all. And of course, this is a table that an internal employee is going to be very attracted to modifying, giving themselves a nice little raise ahead of time and those types of things. So don't forget about this type of data either. 
All right, so accessing data. Mostly, we talk about select statements. Um, you know, there's a couple different things you'll see. Uh, these are pretty generic syntax up here, but you're just looking for name, address, social security number. Uh, the difference in the second one here, you're retrieving a specific record, but what's kind of interesting about this is the social security number is actually in the statement. So now my audit log contains social security numbers. And now all of a sudden, the audit log has to be protected about as well as the underlying database. Uh, I bring this up because we're talking today and we'll be going into more detail about audit logs being held outside of the database they're monitoring, which is very good from a segregation of duties because if I'm monitoring a privileged user or a DBA and I leave that audit log on the database I'm monitoring and they have full privileges to that database, how good is that audit log? It's not all that reliable. It's not all that useful. And the auditors, so-so mm, on it. So uh, keep, keep that kind of information in mind as well. So that's just something to point out. Um, you know, know what's going into your audit trails. Uh, if you deal with, if you take credit cards, and how much many of you deal with PCI? Good third of the room or so. Uh, they have very specific requirements, and they even specify in the PCI standard, protect every source where that credit card number is stored, including audit trails. They call it out by name. So don't forget your audit trails and securing those. All right. Uh, so that gets into all your requirements around protecting logs. Um, these little I's uh, just mean implied because if anybody's dealt with these regulations, they say really handy things like secure your audit logs, log security related events, really helpful information. So that's where that comes from. And this is basically what they want you to do around the audit log itself. Limit access. Duh. That kind of seems pretty obvious. Um, separate the DBAs and the databases being monitored from the actual audit trail. We talked about that a little bit. Um, you know, prevent changes so that it's a read-only system. Uh, make sure there's sufficient storage capacity so you don't have all the overwrite issues, particularly those of you in Microsoft environments. Uh, encrypt sensitive data. So all of a sudden, not only are you having to go to the expense of encrypting the, the database where the customer data resides, now you've got to have encryption on your database logs as well. And, and again, that, that gets back to that, that sample select statement. Uh, and alert on any, any changes, capacities, events, whatever. So those are kind of some of the things that are specified across all these different regulations. Pick your flavor. Sarbanes-Oxley, HIPAA for healthcare, CMS is for healthcare. Um, 21 part 11 is any pharmaceuticals uh, or medical equipment device. You know, even if you make hospital beds, like just the metal frame beds, you get regulated by the FDA. <laughs> like, you know, it's not really a drug going into the body, but yes, even hospital beds get regulated and are subject to that. GLBA financial, ISO whatever. Uh, NERC is utilities, and then finally for any of you who are in the Fed, suddenly FISMA has a lot more teeth to it since that whole veterans it little thing, you know, the 26 and a half some odd million social security numbers lost, um, that didn't really have any teeth until now, and all of a sudden, hmm, that, that sort of bad press somehow seems to have a lot more impact than Senate, the, the congressman passing laws. It, it's funny. Power of the press, I guess. All right. Go ahead. Uh, also, uh, you know, in addition to monitoring select statements, as you guys know, you deal with databases, there's a lot of other ways to retrieve data out of the database. So while I use selects as my example throughout here, you know, copies, loads, ETL um, programs, extract, transfer, and load, uh, backup routines. Um, we've seen a number of cases where data got left on a, lost on a UPS truck from a backup tape. That's sort of the non-malicious but still bad thing that can happen, um, and all those types of other things. 
When you're looking at this stuff, what you're looking for are things like unexpected application IDs. So if you've got an Oracle database sitting behind an SAP application, one of my favorite scenarios given the competitive issues there, um, you know, it looks pretty suspicious when there's a select statement or a backup statement uh, from something other than a known application. So that's something to look for. Uh, unusual syntax, if all your uh, SQL statements are coming out of the application, those are kind of hard-coded. They're pretty fixed. You start seeing some, some SQL syntax that looks unusual or different than the usual, than, uh, than what comes out of the application, uh, something worth investigating, uh, and unusual source IP addresses. Most of the time, your application servers are on a fixed IP address, so it, you, know, you should have some idea as to where that activity is, is coming from. Of course, there's all kinds of ways to get around those things as well, but those are, those are a place to start. Uh, so review and retention requirements. As I said, you're looking for all those sorts of things. Um, how many of you have somebody in your organization with the hideous job of reviewing audit logs daily? I'm so sorry for that person. I hope it's not you. <laughs> I can't imagine. I mean, how, how much audit data do you generate in a day? 15 gigs. And that person's just supposed to kind of manually look through it and suddenly go, aha, that one's a problem. It's, it's just utterly insane. I don't know what they were thinking when they came up with this stuff, but daily or monthly or whatever your column falls into. What, what I tend to find is because you're generally subject to two or three or four or five or ten regulations, you just go with the least common denominator. So on each of these tables, figure out which is the most onerous thing to do and do it and then you're covered for everything. And so far they haven't gotten any more onerous than daily. Um, although some of them do phrase daily or more frequent as needed. So um, that's, that's when you definitely need some help and backup and audit trails and all those sorts of things. Okay. All right, so native versus network data access auditing. We had a few hands that said they're doing this natively. If you would. So what we're looking at here, uh, go ahead and build this slide out, please. All right. One more, I think. Okay, one more. All right, there we go. <laughs> so you've got, you know, your basic DML stuff coming from your end users quite a bit. From your privileged users, you get a little bit more of DCL, DDL, depending, you know, they're doing a little bit more maintenance, creating roles, altering roles, creating objects, tables, what have you. So you need to be monitoring all of that. Your options generally fall into, one, the native audit logs. Um, two, database auditing from tools that pull out of those native audit logs and they can get pretty creative and combine data from multiple databases, multiple platforms, or three, what we're talking about today, which is network-based data auditing, and that sits in front of the database, captures all the traffic going into the database, and gives you a complete audit trail. And uh, if you would, go ahead. Um, some of the reasons, some of the limitations that you'll see in the native database auditing uh, are, of course, performance. We've talked about that a little bit. Uh, it is vulnerable to insiders because it's going to sit on the database usually. You can always redirect, but quite frequently it sits on the database being monitored. Um, you're going to have trouble combining it across multiple instances, so the poor person's going to have to log into each database and look at those logs individually, um, making it kind of complex and, and difficult to aggregate. So those are just kind of some of the things that you're going to face. Uh, in addition, native databases don't always put everything into their logs, and I think we have that. Just to give you an idea here, if you would, yeah. So Oracle, you have to turn on the fine-grained auditing. Um, that's enhanced with 10G, so if you're all the way up to 10G, life's a little better there. Um, in Microsoft SQL Server, uh, there's nothing that really goes into native logs. You're not going to scrape it out of a syslog, for example. Uh, you have to do it with the, the trace function to get data access. 
You can get other things, but specifically data access, select, auditing, et cetera. Um, Sybase, DB2, Informix, uh, those all have some capabilities there, and you can see on the screen kind of the, what you should be looking for the, for the data access. Uh, generally, yeah. MySQL, do you know the specific command? Binary and full text. Yeah. So again, when you, whenever you're, all the rest of it, like the access logging failed login intents and such, most databases can handle that pretty well. When you start monitoring select statements, particularly if it's a heavily used database and application combination, um, you really start hitting some performance issues um, just because of the quantity of the data involved. Um, often it's, very not, it's not very granular. You kind of have to just turn it on for everything or turn it off so you can't focus it at a particular table uh, or column of data, for example. Um, and sometimes you can't just say turn on select auditing. It's turn on all kinds of auditing. And again, that just goes back to performance issues. Um, sometimes, and I think in particular, Informix is fairly bad about this. You don't really get full information in the native logs, with, such as user ID, source IP, table name. Sometimes you get references. And then you've got to trace the references over to figure out what table name that was. So when you're being asked to audit, I want to know who did what when to which set of data. It becomes a very, very complex issue through the native logs to find that data. So that's just kind of some things uh, to deal with. And, uh, and then our full favorite is you know, a full audit log can stop the database in some cases. And, that doesn't make the business very happy. So, all right. So, looking at um, a generic architecture, very much a generic architecture for na network based auditing, you're going to have some users, you're going to have your monitored database. Um, somewhere in there, you're going to have a tap off of the network so that you can, you can essentially network sniffer, copy all traffic destined for that database. Um, you're probably going to need a collector of some sort. This is the whole agent fight that everybody loves to have, not another agent. If you want to monitor DBA activity, most of the time privileged users are performing that activity locally. They're logged in directly to the database. Maybe they've come through a telnet session. They're not coming across the network wire. So the only way to capture that data generally is to sit and, and get it off of the database itself. But at least you've reduced the, the work that the database server is doing down to just that tiny bit of privileged user activity, rather than asking the database to handle all of your monitoring activity. So you need some sort of reader to collect all of that. It's going to come into to, uh, a central dispatcher of sorts. Um, if you've got some alerting capabilities, some real time, that's nice, that's handy. Uh, shove it off into an audit repository so that you can then generate all those reports that the auditors want to see and you can tell them to go away. Yeah, yeah, here's your report. Um, because most likely you're going to care about alerts, right? You're going to set up real time alerts to say there's some really suspicious activity, I want to know about it immediately. Past that, it's pretty historical. This is a detect function. This is not going to prevent the attack. This is just simply going to limit its loss. It's going to let you know uh, what's happening as soon as possible. And that, of course, goes out to some sort of console and, and some sort of alerting function and generate reports. OK? Any questions about that kind of architecture? What's that? What if it's all encrypted? It depends on where and how it's encrypted. Um, when, yeah, if you're using a network encryption device, you want to insert yourself between the decrypt and the database. Um, Microsoft 2005 has done this lovely thing where they're encrypting the, the header information, but not the data. 
the, the logon packets. So we don't know who it came from because we can't see that data, but we, we can see the data itself. So that's really helpful and handy. Um, if it is fully encrypted within the application uh, all the way to the database, things get pretty tricky. Um, at that point, uh, you know, you are looking at, at reading stuff out of the database after it's decrypted it uh, or possibly sharing the encryption key with your audit device. Yes? Well, now remember, we're not auditing the data that's, that's being returned from the queries. We're auditing the activity and the requests for the data. So we want to know who's asked for what, who's tried to, you know, grant a new user or role or, or that type of stuff. Once it gets to the database, it should most definitely be encrypted uh, when uh, in storage and in transit, the data itself in transit as well. Right, and, and so yeah, but you, need, you do need a full audit log and your native audit logs often won't, won't give you everything you need around data access. So it's, if you wanna turn on full grain auditing uh, for all the select statements, yeah, but and then you get your performance issues. So by, by all means, like everything in the security space, uh, it's choices and decisions that you need to make as to what works best for, for your application and your needs. Yes. Right, yeah, archival of the audit trails themselves. Um, generally, in terms of the regulatory guidance, and I think this is about right, is about 30 to 90 days online on the device, immediately accessible, and a year's worth uh, offline. And so, yeah, you're gonna run your, your backup and storage routines. If there's sensitive data in terms of the actual customer information, social security numbers, whatever, in your audit trails, then you're gonna wanna encrypt that backup data as well. Uh, so you're asking within the native database functions, can you select just particular um, privileged users that you want to audit um, rather than, than an all or nothing audit all privileged users? Um, from an audit perspective, I'm gonna tell you to audit all privileged users because they're privileged users. So, you know, I, you know they're, they're trusted or they're not. Uh, and I can't imagine a scenario where one DBA I'm going to audit and another DBA I'm not. Uh, in terms of across the platforms, their capabilities. Uh, I think you can check that through inclusion rules and what the point of audit based on the users. On the network side, if you're taking the network approach, you're auditing everything and the filter comes on the reporting end of things, which is kind of nice because if an auditor comes along and changes their mind and says, you know what, I want to see that you're looking at this other data, then you don't have to scramble and say, hmm, we didn't turn that on because, you know, performance-wise, there was only so much we were going to audit. Um, you just simply recraft your filters and report on the new data. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you get basically session pooling and, and database applications perform the activity to the database as a single account. Um, it's, that's, that's a tricky problem to solve. If you have some knowledge, uh, like if you have access into that application, um, you, can, you can do some matching with some time date stamps and some other things uh, around that pooling information. Uh, but it can get pretty tricky 
but the database, the native database isn't going to know it either. So you definitely have to do um, some interesting things when your auditors mandate that you must know exactly which end user, application user, performed that activity. Um, at a security level, you're, remember that this is just part of a, a grander security scheme, and you're relying on some security within your application in terms of access controls and, and roles and privileges and such like that. Um, so generally, I, I'm going to be a, really concerned about any kind of data access that didn't come from that application ID. Um, because not everything can be done at the database level. Yeah. Right, so the question is generally you want to know what, what data is, is being requested um, in, in addition to what privileged users activity. So one of the things that we'll, we talk about and I think is, is one of the report filters we were gonna, we'll show you is uh, a select statement greater than X rows. So in some applications that might be greater than one because let's say I'm a customer service rep on a 1-800 number. I should only be pulling one record at a time because I'm only dealing with one customer at a time. That might generate a lot of false positives and so I might bump that up to 10. Uh, in other applications, in data warehouses, you're pulling millions of records because you're doing analysis on, uh, you know, across, a, you know, statistics across all those records. So that's something that very much has to be adjusted on a, uh, based on the business use and the business purpose of that database. Uh, but it's something that, that I would definitely recommend where you, where you look at, you know, if they're pulling more than five rows, 10,000 rows, whatever your cutoff is, that's pretty curious. That looks like somebody downloading the entire database. They may be doing it for legitimate business purposes. There's been no indication that, that the uh, uh, VA law, data loss was that the guy was doing anything other than legitimate business purposes. But still, one is a little curious about 26 and a half million social security records being loaded onto a laptop. And as a security person, I'd kind of like to call and say, hey, you know, what you doing with that? By the way, you're not to take it off site. You, it needs to be, you know, stored on a secured laptop, encrypted, that kind of thing. So, all right. So that's kind of one of those rules around data access auditing. That's one of those things to look for. Um, eh, skip this one. All right, so uh, this gets kind of into the, actually we've been pretty interactive so far. I, I'm almost grateful for that it, uh, we don't have 500 people. It makes it harder to, to have a conversation here. Um, so we're gonna move over and just look at some different kinds of filters and rules um, that you can and should be building. And that's pretty hard to see, isn't it? So let's go ahead and look at the one um, that we had around the, the um, select statements, the, the large select statements. What's that? Uh, one of ours. Monitoring, yeah. Again, not here, you know. You know the pitch, you know the drill. Uh, the filters, though, I mean, are really pretty much going to be the same across the board. Um, it's, it's what data you're looking for. So we've pulled in, um, you know, time, date, stamp, uh, of course, the, the size, because um, it's kind of hard to filter on that if you haven't included that information in there. And then... We're running on a VMware, so of course that takes a little extra time. But basically the filter is just going to be greater than. So we'll ask somebody, would pick a number. What, what for your application would be a large amount of data returns? Oh, okay. On the development side. So you're one of those people asking for all this data so you can run tests. 
And we're telling you, no, you can't have it. There's sensitive information in there. Because at least personally, you know, I don't see any reason a developer needs my social security number to, to build a database and test it. So uh, how about someone else who, who's more on the, the security or the monitoring side? What would you consider a, a large data return? What's that, 500 rows? OK, or we can do 300 meg. What's that? 2.6. <laughs> Yes, you can. You can, you can in, in uh, I don't know that that's across every platform, but. So the statement was just limiting the number of rows that could be returned uh, to, to something that you consider reasonable, and then people have to make a request when they want a lot more. Um, you know, we're, I'm very much trying to keep this in context of realistic uh, within the business uh, and what what you can get away with and what they will they will allow you to do. And, and some businesses um, allow security that much. Um, authority and, and um, tightness, as it were, a lot do not, unfortunately, still today. Yeah, it would very much depend on the application owner. And it very much varies from application to application. As I said, we, you know, we have customers that run Teradata um, you know, for a data warehouse, and they are pulling millions of rows, and that's the end user. That's not a DBA ganking a bunch of data for a developer uh, to test with. Yes? Mm hmm. Right. So the question is, uh, rather than signature-based, looking for something that's more anomaly-based. Uh, in terms of, of industry capabilities, that's not nearly as far along across the board. Um, certainly, if you want to review the data, pretty much everybody in this space will give you the full SQL statements so that you can see things like that. Uh, and you can probably write some rules. but. It, but once you write the rule, you're still, you're kind of back to being more signature based and not quite anomaly based. So yeah, I would say that in general things are not that advanced. Of course, you'd get none of that from the native logging. Um, has anybody out there built just their own little scripts or tools for that kind of analysis? Get some heads nodding. Right, behavioral learning type uh, uh, around database activity. Right. Right, exactly. So setting baselines, monitoring the traffic, comparing and saying, you know, our application always writes a select statement this way. If you see it, in any other construct, you know, if there's an extra equal sign or if there's an extra command in there, whatever, kick it out, it's a problem. So yeah, very much an arsenal approach. Um, I think that is, <laughs> there's always this trade-off between um, compliance and security, and I often think that those are conflicting goals, <laughs> especially since they tend to eat up the same budget. Um, that very much, you know, is, is a, a security enhancement, but doesn't always satisfy an auditor who's, who's uh, less understanding and less well-trained. 
So, yeah. Right, yeah. Right, so the comment is that, you know, looking at, at unusual application IDs, source IP addresses, et cetera, uh, building some correlation rules. I haven't seen a lot in the way of, of um, IDS systems that handle that gracefully at the data access level. Um, so, uh, but there are rules you can build, and there are definitely things. And I think you've had kind of And this is just data being pulled from a, a dummy database where we play against it and generate activity and therefore can, can have some reports back out. So um, what were some of the other, if you'd uh, flip back over to the slides, we had kind of, um, so we've, we've talked about some anomaly stuff. What other kind of reports come to mind? The large selects, oh, failed select statements. So, you know, in the normal course of business, somebody retrieving data, occasionally you're going to get a failed statement. You start seeing, again, kind of signature based, you start seeing a large number of failed selects from a particular ID in a very short time. That seems curious. It seems like somebody who legitimately has access to the database, um, but perhaps not to everything in the database in their poking around, seeing what else they've got access to, if there's some tables that, uh, you know, that uh, have any kind of access controls on them, et cetera. So, um, yeah, the SQL injection would show up there, uh, some of it. And I've heard talk, and, and I don't know if there's anything commercially available yet, um, kind of some replay tools, you know, where you take that, that injection code, pull it out, run it in a sandboxed environment so you can see exactly what it was they're going after and what the results were. Sure. What, what uh, specifically, what, what topics, what data are you looking for? Yeah, so let's, let's go back to the, the query and just look at the query itself. The report, I mean, the report is just, like I said, out of a dummy database. So let's, let's go back and, and look at the query. Essentially, from any network-based tool, they're capturing absolutely everything. So anything that's being passed to that database, you should be able to retrieve in a report. So um, source IP the database user ID, if, if there is one, um, network ID, if that's being passed, you've got the issues with the applications and, and session pooling and such. Um, all, of that, all of that information is available to you. Time date stamps. I, Sorry, I can't actually see the screens from where I am, so I, I don't know what, what fields are being selected. But again, any, any solution you're looking at in this space should capture absolutely everything that's being passed to the database, and therefore should be able to return that to you in a report. How, how big a storage? Uh, depends on how much you're capturing, obviously, how many instances you're monitoring. Um, it can range from gigabytes to terabytes. Um, same, same amount of storage you would need if it were sitting on the database server. It's, really, it's just offloading it. Right, 
Yes, so the question was the, the intelligence to capture the, the uh, inbound command as opposed to the data return because you, you don't want the million rows that it's returning in your repository because then your repository would be outrageous and really it would just be a replication of the underlying database. So that would be a little on the silly side, yeah. Question in the back again? Yeah, so the question is from an auditing perspective, how do you satisfy the auditors that everything really is being captured, uh, not dropping packets during a heavy load, those types of things. Um, that that's really comes down to uh, making sure that you have the right amount of equipment, um, the right equipment uh, that can handle that kind of load and doing some, some packet sniffing and proving to yourself or to your auditors that everything is being captured. Um, you know, in some environments that may, you know, mean a couple of monitoring servers as opposed to one. Um, yeah, dozens, it, it really, that, that varies, but that really should be an implementation um, thing, so. And if, if you're, um, you know, if you're looking, there's all kinds of ways to blend and solve this problem in a blended manner in terms of uh, using something like this for monitoring your data access, but continuing to use the native logs for, for your login attempts and, and things like that. So there's certainly, uh, you know, there's a variety of ways, and, and I'm, I'm very much trying to give you a global picture of the entire industry uh, and stay away from specifics. Right, so he's asking, work with your auditor to, to define what you need to audit so that you're not auditing absolutely everything. And again, that can reduce the workload and, and the probability of things getting dropped. Um, logically, yes, that is true. From a business perspective, yes, that is true. Um, realistically, some of you may encounter some auditors that are a little hard-headed and you can't convince them. Yeah, so, so you fire them. Unfortunately, Sarbanes-Oxley's made that pretty difficult to do. Um, the balance of power right now has shifted from the companies being in charge because they were sending all this money to the audit firms and, and you know, we, they could fire an audit firm in a heartbeat and there was no repercussions. Sarbanes-Oxley shifted that balance to where there's a lot of repercussions, at least your external auditors. If you're a financial institution, your auditor is not an external company you can fire. It's a government agency and you don't get any choice. <laughs> so I don't know if everybody could hear of it, but there's a, a, a voice of experience, it sounds like, over here saying that the auditors may change their mind from month to month as to what they want, and they want you to have been collecting it for the past two years. It's not just going forward we would like you to start auditing. It's you should have been auditing this all along, and I'm going to ding you. Um, the reality of that, too, is that um, you know there's been a huge increase in demand for auditors and not as much increase in the supply. So there have been a lot of people brought into the audit industry that perhaps five years ago would not have ended up as an IT auditor. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the question is, a majority of access comes from an application into a database, and is there a way to detect misuse that comes from outside that application? Um, but I don't think there's any guaranteed ways, but uh, again, looking at um, unusual source IP addresses, you're going to know what your, your application servers are. 
of course, there is ways to spoof that. Um, uh, looking for that unusual syntax that it was not generated by the application server. Uh, those are kind of the, the things that come to my mind off the top of my head for, for looking for things that come outside that application server. You will also have some tools, some backup and, and recovery tools and other, other applications um, that will be involved with that. Your DBAs may have some tools that they use for administering and grooming databases. So keep that uh, in mind as well when you kind of set up those rules and filters. So um, why don't you go back, uh, if you would. Let's see. Uh, unauthorized source IP, we have kind of talked about those a little bit. If you would just kind of go into the query interface and we'll look at some of the different types of data. Again, very hard to read, I know. Um, so query. Query status, um, you know, failed, successful, active, session information, all that's in there. But uh, again, primarily data, data access. Yes. So the suggestion, if I can summarize on dealing with your auditors, which wasn't quite my, my, uh, my title of my presentation, but we seem to have gone that path, is to have a list of what you want to audit and good justification as to why you're auditing those things uh, and not other things. And that gives you much more, a, a much stronger leg to stand on. And, and you say to them, this is what I'm auditing, this is why I'm auditing. Are you okay with that? And, and you come from a position of strength rather than, what would you like me to audit? What should I be auditing? So simply having that list and feel free to steal from, from this presentation as to what, what uh, that will get you started on a list as to what to include. Okay. Sure. Sure. Now I make no guarantees as to the amount of data in the fake database. <laughs> I, I, you can imagine why, for, for many reasons, we would not be showing you data from a, a live database, <laughs> or even a copy of a, a live production database. Uh, the back end on this one for demo purposes is access. Oh, Postgres on this one? Okay. Real life uh, depends on the solution you choose. Um, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, what company you, do, you go with, Sybase, DB2, pretty much all of them are options uh, for, for housing your, your monitoring repository. Because <laughs> now you know where it came from. You can go hunt them down. Right. Yeah, and, and again, you know, there's a combination there. Mo getting all the traffic that's coming across the network, capturing the local traffic that's happening directly on the database. And you may even want to find a way to combine in some of the data that's coming from the native logs as well. The agent-based technology that would sit on the server. Uh, the Windows looking at 
uh, TCP traffic, name pipes traffic, uh, Oracle, TCP, that's it. Uh, yeah, localhost activity, yes. What's that? Log the data. Uh, yeah, these, um, I think all, almost all the uh, solutions in the industry put this log data into, back into a, a relational database. That's how you're able to retrieve this and, and slice it and dice it any which way you, you please, as opposed to a flat file. <laughs> Can you connect to ours and full events out? Yeah. So we're starting to get into some pretty specific questions here, which I, of course, don't mind, but, um, but uh, be happy to, to let you guys go. Um, anybody who wants to stay and has additional questions or would like to see very specific filters or reports to see if the kind of data you're looking for can be retrieved from a system like that, um, feel free. Yes. Compliance versus reality. Uh, compliance, if you start looking at the DOD specifications or the CIS benchmarks in terms of specifying what you should be doing, they all talk about turning on native audit log stuff. Yeah. So you have to kind of write up a report or justify that you are still capturing that same data, but you're doing it through an alternative mechanism because none of the, the people who write this stuff or the auditors uh, really understand that, that an outside the database solution is possible for d auditing. Uh, yeah, so if you're sitting off of a network switch or a network tap, you're going to have um, IP and, and port filters so that it's only capturing uh, the, the traffic bound for the database. Because otherwise it'd get overwhelmed by network traffic and it wouldn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Right, yeah, so really there's kind of four ways to go at this. this is, there's write your own scripts that, that, um, and tools and techniques that combine data from lots of different databases and what have you. Um, there are uh, like log management systems that will scrape data out of certain log files, but not all of them. Um, there are log-based solutions that are a little bit more than the log management solutions because they'll do things like use the SQL trace to capture select statements on Microsoft SQL, which your log management systems won't do, uh, the network based, and then, yeah, sitting uh, agents sitting on the database. So, yeah, there's lots of different ways to get at this, mix and match depending on what your, you know, corporate needs are. Sure. What, what is it you would like to see? Oh, sure. Yeah, and these are just things that I came up with in terms of auditing data access. By no means, I mean, there's all kinds of, anything you can think of, of building a report on, you can build it on any of these tools because that's the whole point. You just slice it out, you divide it into a relational database and yank it back into a report. Kind of line speed on the appliances. Uh, most of these appliances sit offline, as it were, so they're not, they're not uh, interacting with, uh, they're, they're not, I shouldn't say they're not interfering with the, the application database. Yeah, that, that varies from solution to solution. Traffic.
And then the other, the other swap of that is, is one appliance handling a, a cluster of databases as well, uh, which again is not always as graceful as one would like it to be um, because there are complications and pooling and what have you. So. All right, guys. Well, thanks very much, and I think there are drinks out the door. <laughs>